Thank you. Thanks for having me here. I um, was so impressed by the tuck shop talk earlier, so I've got big shoes to fill here. Right, I'm going to get my Prezzo honey. Here we go. I'm going to briefly take you through the foundations of the messaging work that we do. So values, frames and audiences. Some top tips for persuading leaders and others. And time for Q&A. So here we go. Very condensed version here. Uh, this slide is a simplified version of the values that we hold as human beings. So it comes from the work of a social psychologist working in the 70s who surveyed 65,000 people in 68 countries around the world. And he was really interested in the values that occur across countries and cultures. So these are the 10 value segments he found. I um, won't go into them in detail, but I will point out a really important finding uh, that, that he, he came across, which is our values segment into intrinsic values and extrinsic values. So the intrinsic values at the top there are care for other people. Uh, so benevolence values, care for our close circle, friends, family, work colleagues. Beyond that, in universalism, to people we might never meet. So equality and social justice, beyond that, to nature, protecting the environment is one of those values in there. And then next to that is self-direction values. So this is about curiosity, creativity, freedom, choosing own goals, so kind of the self exploring the world, learning, growing. Um, so those are called intrinsic because they just sort of spring up within us. They don't require any sort of external reward, um, whereas the extrinsic ones do. So, for example, in the power segment, we've got the value of wealth, and next to that, an achievement. Um, that's achievement in the socially validated way, like you got a good mark or um, a work promotion or something. So we all have all the values, and it's not that sort of some are good or bad, um, but the interesting thing is the intrinsic values are really strongly associated with concern for and action on um, social and environmental issues. And especially when we're talking about something like the health of um, students at our school or the health of people we work with in a workplace, that's definitely tapping into those intrinsic and especially the benevolence, the close circle values, people that we care for. So ideally we want to engage those values. So that's values in a nutshell in about two minutes. Um, frames, I'm going to ask you what you see here. So just call out what you see. Dark bird, rabbit. Rabbit. Some people go, oh, I can finally see the, the duck if you first saw the rabbit or vice versa. So if you're having trouble seeing it, the bill of the bird becomes the ears of the rabbit. Is that clear to everyone now that I pointed out? Can you see both the, the duck and the rabbit? I use this to illustrate frames and framing because for any issue, there's going to be multiple ways of framing it, but there are often two very stark ways of thinking and talking about that issue. So one will be the duck, if we want to take that as sort of the advocate way of promoting healthy food, um, that that's a valid role for schools and workplaces. Um, and then there'll be an opposing view, the rabbit, which is basically um, people who do not support that at all, that that should not be the role of a school or a workplace, it should not be the role of government, that's you know, nanny state, you shouldn't tell us what we put in our mouths. So there is, that's a very different way of looking at this issue. Now, the interesting thing is, which is why I'm going to take you through audiences, is that we have a sort of um, spectrum of people where, where there's people who are our diehard supporters that absolutely believe that and will volunteer for us and will take that message forward. At the other end, we have the opponents um, who absolutely disagree, um, who might use, you know, the terms that I did, like nanny state and that kind of thing, that that's not something any of us should tell anybody, you know, what to eat. Um, and then in the middle, we have this very broad group of persuadable people. So the vast middle ground of people will rapidly toggle between those two points of view. So whichever they hear the most often, the most persuasively, they tend to agree with. Um, so they can toggle readily between, oh yeah, I see, that's a good point. I can see basically the duck. I can see that it's important for us to provide these options for people. And then if they hear the exact opposite thing from opponents, they'll say, oh yeah, no, we are individuals and that, that's not 
you know, that should be our personal choice, not an organisational choice. So they will toggle between those frames. So the key thing is to realise that we need to tell our story, if we're calling it the duck, and we need to steer away from inadvertently telling that opponent's story. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So I have five key tips for you. Um, so these tips we developed um, out of two sources. One is the Healthy Persuasion Guide that we developed for Vic Health. So this pulls together a whole bunch of research over many topics, um, including healthy eating. And then the other source is a Healthy Workplaces Guide um, that I developed for SA Queensland and New South Wales. Um, and that was about how do we motivate workplace leaders to um, do more for workplace health and wellbeing, healthy eating and a whole bunch of other things as well. So we learnt these five big things that I'll share with you. The first one is to use values rather than facts to persuade. So it's not that facts don't matter, but we want to lead with that reason why this is so important. Uh, and that's essentially those intrinsic care values. Um, so the interesting thing, as I said, you know, from this values work, we have those values. They're there ready to be activated and switched on. And the way we do that is, again, duck, to tell our story of it's really important that schools and workplaces um, support and improve the health and wellbeing of the people there. So when we talked to workplace leaders, um, interviews, focus groups, surveys, um, the central idea everyone, was everyone deserves to work in a place where their health and wellbeing matter. So a whole bunch of different sort of motivations and statements. This was the one that got the most support. It's a very simple idea that our health and wellbeing matter and no matter whether we're in work or out of work or the same idea you know, at school, outside school, our health is really important to us. Um, so in the way that workplace lead leaders talked about their organisations, they saw them as almost like a home for the people there and so therefore, you know, yeah, you want to care for the people there. So they talked about things like, we care for our people, we should look after the people who work for us, we want to create a healthy workplace, we want to walk the talk, embed health and wellbeing in all our systems, make health and wellbeing a normal part of what we do here. So that statement, everyone deserves to work in a place where their health and wellbeing matters, obviously centering that idea of care for people who work there. Um, when we inserted a, a more sort of compliance legal responsibility story, um, which is still about responsibility and caring, but it has a different slant to it, um, some leaders accepted it and some rejected it. They started to push back and debate whether something like healthy eating is actually a responsibility or a compliance issue. So to get away from that kind of debate element, just stick with the, the plainer care statement, the one on the right, on much safer ground there. Um, or in a school setting, for example, yes. We want schools with healthy food for every child. It's pretty hard to argue against that. The other thing we found, so again, want to say centre care values more than financial performance. So um, in the survey, we are, so it's an anonymous survey. It's not like a focus group where they might feel pressure to, you know, say the right thing in front of people, but asking about what's your main motivation for supporting health and wellbeing in your workplace? Uh, so they had a choice of two things, either positive outcomes for our people or positive financial outcomes for our workplace. Um, so two in three leaders uh, chose the positive outcomes for our people. Um, so they themselves are saying, well, this is important. And then you know, those statements we, we heard, like um, providing a place where we care for our people, that kind of thing. All right, second tip, externalise the problem. What does that mean? So an internalised problem is it's my choice and my responsibility, what I put in my mouth. An externalised version is I need to have options available to me and um, there's an organisation, there's a collective of us who decide on what options are available. So if we want to create healthier food environments, 
then we need to put that organisation rather than the individual front and centre. Um, so that does two things. It tells us who needs to act, and that's all of us as an organisation or a you know, group of employees or a school, rather than just individual choices. And I've, you know, it's my problem if I don't have good health because I've chosen the wrong thing. Um, it also then takes away the defensiveness and the blame. It, so don't make it an individual um, problem or, or choice. Make it an organisational collective problem to be solved. Um, so things like everyone deserves to work in a place where their health and wellbeing matter. Can you see how that's externalising and putting the organisation front and centre? We provide healthy morning teas for our staff. Schools are a great place to make sure every children can access healthy food or to make sure every child gets good food. Um, yeah, and a picture of a morning tea. Um, so just recently running some workshops at Queensland Health, providing the most amazing morning teas that everybody loved. And I'll show you a picture of um, someone enjoying that in a moment, um, which I asked and took permission, uh, got permission for. Uh, so you can do the same thing. So show pictures of happy kids or happy people enjoying good food. Um, so really what we're trying to do by putting the organisation front and centre is telling our story, the duck. Um, so we have a collective, in this case an organisational responsibility to provide options for everybody, uh, which also taps into a health equity story. We want to steer away from that individual, individual responsibility and choice um, frame, which leads to this idea of sort of limited role for governments or organisations and sort of, you know, talk of special treatment or, or equity, uh, sorry, rather than health equity, nanny state. Um, so, yeah, so that's our frame. The organisation can provide a great place for everyone to be healthy. We can do it in a subtle way as well, rather than talking about we need to make healthy choices, easy choices. We can talk about making healthy options, standard options or default options, or easy options as well, but it's that key idea of providing options rather than the individual making choices. So that's tip two, externalise the problem. Tip three is one that I've already mentioned to you. So to stick to our story and avoid telling that opponent's story. So tell me where's the problem in this statement. It's not true that unhealthy food tastes better. Healthy food can also be delicious. What are we doing there in that statement? Yeah, yeah, and also... Yeah, so it's saying, oh, it's... it's you know, <laughs> it's, it's tapping into the opponent frame that only unhealthy food tastes good and unhealthy food doesn't taste good. So we, we don't need to go there. We can just take it um, as a given that healthy food's good, makes us feel great, that's really our story. The one thing, if you take away from this and, and do nothing else, don't myth bust because when you myth bust, you just reinforce the myth. Um, so we don't really remember the... The, the not in a myth bust. We're just getting that idea of, oh, I'm not sure if it's going to taste okay. So instead, just assume that it is delicious. Delicious healthy food makes us feel great. It helps us go about our day with more energy. So that key idea that good food makes us feel great. And I think um, in the last session, Madonna, you might have said something similar about, yeah, fueling our bodies and making us feel good. So that's our story. Avoid myth busting or, or saying it's not that thing that we don't want to draw people's attention to. Fourth tip, create something good. Create more good than bad. So any time we start talking about banning or restricting things, the persuadables get turned off. But we can say exactly this statement um, and flip it into the positive. So rather than this will ban junk food marketing at, at children's sport grounds, we can say this will ensure our kids enjoy sport free from junk food marketing. So you can see it's talking about the same policy. It's just one is saying um, banning, restricting. The other one is about the good stuff. Of course, we want our kids to enjoy their sport free of junk food marketing. Uh, similar concept, swapping, not stopping. Again, I think in the tuck shop session you touched on this. So... Um, stop it. rather than saying we're taking this thing away for you, from you, it's what are we providing now? 
and that's a swap. So if the cream biscuits are going to come out of the tea room, then emphasise what's in their place. So swapping rather than stopping. And the fifth tip, keep it real. So this is really about telling personal stories, translating abstract things into really tangible case studies, testimonials, real people, um, and modelling the change. So this saying of show, don't tell. So if you introduce a, a healthy um, food item to the, to the tuck shop and the kids like it, tell that story or um, a healthy morning tea in the workplace. Um, so that just helps normalise. It says, well, this is the kind of organisation we are. This is what we do here. And people like it. People want it. So here's this um, picture from Quezan Health. Show happy people enjoying what you're providing, uh, whether that's staff or students in your case. Um, and again, yeah, it's just reinforcing this idea of swapping, not stopping. So there's you know, a huge opportunity, no matter what setting we're talking about, to use those testimonials to showcase that with leaders. That's very persuasive to leaders because one of the things we found is one of their main fears is that if they're making a big change, that people won't like it. So um, first up, do the basically community engagement to find out what people would like. Do as much of that as you can. You won't obviously be able to do everything and you won't please everybody, as we heard in the last session. But at least, you know, if you know that most people have said their favourite thing is sushi or whatever the item is and you can do that, then that's obviously a huge head start. So that's sort of stopping resistance right at the start. Um, and then if you've done all that groundwork, by the time you implement it, it is very likely that people will like it and want it and then showcase that and you can re reassure leaders that it's been a good change. So that's it in a nutshell. Just to recap the five, so use care values to persuade. Um, so um, when I was comparing about financial performance, it still needs to stack up financially. It's just that we lead with the why. Like this matters because we're talking about people, talking about pro um, providing access to healthy food to kids in school or people in our workplace, whatever the case may be. So lead with those care values, centre the organisation rather than the individual, stick to your story, don't inadvertently tell the opponent's story by myth busting, create more good rather than less bad, and keep it real with those personal stories and normalising the change. So that's it from me. I will throw to any questions. Yeah, um, I would go back to the community engagement approach. Um, so ideally you've done that all the way from day dot. But yeah, just work out with people what, what is not quite working. Um, and if, if the whole thing right from the beginning is framed as a team effort, and it you know, legitimately is, and it's, you know, if we're not doing so well here, we all want to be better and all want to be healthier, how can we make that happen? Then that's sort of the a good groundwork to help work through whatever the roadblock is, yeah. Have you been surprised that you work across a number of areas? Are you surprised that the same applies everywhere? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, we do. We um, work on a lot of topics and the same sorts of things do seem to work across topics. I mean, one of the main things, as I mentioned, is persuadables start to turn off a little bit if you're talking about banning or restricting. We find that in a lot of topics. Um, also, when we do messaging, we um, didn't cover just for time, but we, we tend to follow this vision, barrier, action, story structure. And that's because you want to lead with something positive. You say, okay, well, there's something that stands in the way of that, but here's the action or the solution. Um, don't lead with the problem. So especially persuadables, you know, they've got 101 problems in their lives and they don't want you to add another one. Um, so, yeah, lead with the why, the positive outcomes we'll get, that vision what stands in the way and then quickly, yeah, move to here's what we can all do about it. It does feel like people are quite set in their ways now and they've got their ideas and what they want. Do you think we've become more difficult to bring on, to bring on side? Um, yeah, 
yeah, not sure. I mean, be interested in, to hear from others as well. But I think if you're providing, the one constant would be if you're providing great food, like that picture I showed there, like, like the staff, one of the participants is here, I won't put her on the spot, but you know, as soon as that all came out, everyone said, wow, that is an amazing morning tea. So like, people will appreciate, even if it's a bit different, and it won't please everybody, but you know, amongst those sort of six things that were laid out, everybody found something that they enjoyed. Um, yeah, so I think you're working with a good topic matter, like good food is an um, attractive thing. So, yeah. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, anything? Yes? Thank you. Oh, no, sorry, there. Um, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Um, coming from the Department of Health in strategic communications, and we wrestle with these ideas a lot, what would you say to um, people who maybe feel that the way to go with a campaign or a communication is to grab attention and maybe take a fear-based route? That if you're too positive, it'll be wishy-washy, it won't get people's attention. That is a very good question. Uh, so one of the value segments that I didn't really talk about is the security, that's the fear threat one. Um, you can get people's attention very quickly, but it's less likely to lead to sustained motivation and action. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the short story. I think the other side of what you're saying, though, is uh, we still need things to be catchy and, you know, grab people's attention, a million and one things out there in the world. Um, but you can do that in other ways. So make it humorous, make it quirky, make it um, unusual alliances, um, perhaps it's the youngest or oldest people involved in something. I'm going to imagine some great stories from the tuck shops and encouraging people to come along and volunteer. Um, yeah, so there's other ways to make it catchy and interesting apart from just going to the fear threat story. I guess it's something we've been doing today, but just that sharing of knowledge, and that's why it's been great to have the three different sectors here today. Be able to share those stories and that knowledge across the three because there are some commonalities. Across three, meaning the Sports, settings? Yeah, the three settings. So workplaces, um, schools and... Health. Yep. Um, oh, how to sum up. I haven't personally done work with schools, but just as I was hearing the the um, tuck shop session, I mean, it just, again, there's just so many parallels. Um, more work in the workplace setting. Um, but I think, yeah, it is, those five tips do seem to hold across different settings. I would lead with the, with the care values, um, amp up the positive, tell those personal stories. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, a lot of commonality there. I think what also comes across in what you've said is that there's an authenticity to it. You are doing it for a good reason and that comes across. Yes, so you've got a fantastic starting point. Um, so, yeah, really bring that out in your communications and um, when you're engaging with leaders. I mean, one of the things we found in the workplace work is um, trust in the organisation and creating an organisation where people want to work is a really big thing. Um, so I think that is something motivating to leaders and something that, that you can emphasise when you're talking about healthy eating options because that is part of walking the talk. If you want to create that kind of place where people feel that their health and wellbeing is looked after, then this is part and parcel of, of that. One in the middle it's, uh, the human nature is such that, you know, it's like it's called the Teflon uh, Velcro uh, mentality. So the positive thoughts tend to sort of slide off while the negative ones tend to stick to us. So I think it's a matter of, uh, what do you think, like combining, because you have to give them some information that fear or whatever base, that what harm is it doing if you sort of don't do that, but at the same time, uh, uh, providing them with the resources and uh, you know that, that this is how we can sort of deal with it. So I think it's mm. getting that fine balance and that's what all of us struggle with in each of our fields, isn't it? So just, yeah. yeah, I agree. Oh, that's why we have the vision barrier action. So there is that part in there. There's some, you know, if we don't do this, there, there is an implication, but this, this is how we can solve it. Um, and starting with 
the positive that we get from taking action. So again, it's that sort of sandwich um, analogy. Um, yeah, and I mean, you're right with the sort of negativity bias, that, um, what you're saying with it, remember bad things, um, but also hugely motivated by things like caring for the people we care about that we work with or, you know, the kids who we serve in the school, those types of things. So, yeah, we've got both those aspects in us. Um, and, um, yeah, best to use that sort of vision barrier action model to tell the story. Any more? Would you please put your hands together and thank Eleanor for us? Thank you. Okay. So, um, the title of my talk is The Only Way's Up. So how many of you played that in your head? <laughs> Hands up. So you know how old that is? 1988. That was charting. So um, the title of my presentation will become clear as I proceed. But let me just tell you a little bit about where I'm from. So Wide Bay is about probably the quarter of a way up Queensland. Um, we're 215,000 people and um, a large area, 37,000 square metres, and really the two primary sites that I'm talking about today are Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. So, um, how do we do? Why am I here? Um, you've seen the amazing awards that happened at the beginning of the, um, beginning of the day, um, and many of you, particularly those in HHSs, may have seen this document. Um, with uh, several HHSs at the top there and the 54% average. This is the, the year before's figures. But actually, we are there. So actually, we were the worst performing <laughs> HHS um, in Queensland. Um, so this is a little about uh, our journey um, and in particular, um, some of the strategies that we've had to use or I've had to use amongst a whole heap of people to try and bring about some change. So let me just tell you a little bit about our audit, uh, get the shame out of the way. Um, so foods, um, as you would know, um, outlets, um, we're looking at less than 20% in our audit. There were 80% red foods and in our vending machine, 70%. And the drinks, greater than 50%, while ours were 30 and 25. And actually, if you cast your mind back to that map, there were also some rural facilities uh, there was one out there that the vending machine was 100% red. Um, and I think if I took a photo of it, it probably would look like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what were the reactions? Well, there were a few. Uh, there was fix it now. Um, you can guess where that came from. Um, there was, well, I like it how it is. Um, you know, I don't want you to change anything. Um, and then there was a meh, you know. Queensland Health, yeah, just another thing. Um, so really there were these three different um, responses in the mix and it's really how uh, we're going to progress and work across those three. Perhaps let me just tell you um, a little bit about um, senior leadership. So as expected, there is a reputational um, outcome for this if you're the worst performing. And Robin, it's awesome that you have communicated that not only with CEs but with the boards because I think that that really has gained traction and brought it, brought it to light. Um, so obviously as a health, uh, as a hospital, you know, uh, it's important that we set an example to the community so it's a bit disappointing if actually everything that we sell in there um, is not necessarily as healthy as it could be. Um, the resistors, well, you've heard about it from other speakers here, the nanny state, how dare you tell me what I can and can't eat, I should better get my Mars bar. Um, and also the vendors themselves, what about my profits, the anxiety that if you come in and change everything, I'm going to lose all my money. Um, and I think we've already seen um, that um, that's not the case. Um, and initially I wasn't going to include these, but um, they actually sit in the, in the middle of your persuaders as well. Which are the passives, which were the meh? Um, I'll come on to those because I think that they're a group that need to be targeted. Um, but essentially what it felt like was there was, we're at the bottom of this massive hill with this very large red bull for some reason to push up. Um, I can't 
do that on my own. And, and Robin, again, you spoke about a village. Well, I need a, I need a family to help me with this. And the analogy is I've got my immediate family and then there's my extended family. Um, so the guys that are helping me with this, obviously, shout out to the dietitians. Um, I've got a, a, a couple of amazing dietitians, North and South, who've uh, got involved. Um, manager of food services, can't do it without them, um, particularly when one of our point of sales is actually run by the food services itself. And never miss these guys out. Director of communications and marketing, um, getting them on board early is really important because if we're going to bring people along with us, there needs to be a communication plan. That's my, my immediate family. They're my extended family, all of the team at Health and Wellbeing Queensland and statewide food services, um, bringing a, a plethora of knowledge and experience from other sites. So um, how did I frame the senior leadership reaction? Well, I think the best way to do it is let's turn this into an opportunity. Um, so let's transition from being the worst performing HHS in Queensland to one of the best, if not the best, but you know, it's not difficult to get better than naught. Um, for, for, for me, um, two key people in that, again, were the team at Health and Wellbeing Queensland and our media team, because um, communicating this as we go along will be really important. In terms of um, some of the views, um, perhaps, of, of senior leadership around fixing it now was, were, were quite simple, just replace what's in the vending machines. Um, tell the cafe what they can and can't sell, um, or even just take the vending machines away. Um, so, some, some really um, uh, uh, knee-jerk reactions. Um, we've approached this in a couple of ways. First, um, contractual. Um, for those, uh, this was new to me, but we just needed to check. Most contracts do have ABC compliance in them, but you do need to check because they might not have, and in which case the vendor can continue to um, until the contract renews. Um, just doing this ad hoc um, with no planning um, would really cause um, some anxiety in the vendors and may even, uh, the vendors may even leave. Um, so it was important to say that um, there needs to be some consultation before we do this. And the biggest um, that I feel is the end users, is the staff, particularly in HHS, if they just come in one day and there's something there and they come in the next day and it's not there with no planning and no communication around that. So, um, again, um, food services, health and wellbeing, Queensland and statewide food services were, were important. But in terms of influencing up for me, um, communication, engagement um, and commitment, um, we've presented, I've presented what our plan is to the executive to get that into their consciousness and actually um, later next month to the board as well so they know what our plans are and that these plans need um, time to come to fruition and actually made it a standing agenda item on our nutrition committee, which sits under the healthcare standards. So that was the first part. Um, the next we come on to um, resistors. Um, and for us, and I don't think this is a surprise to any of you, the consumers, which are our staff, and then the vendors themselves. Uh, for consumers, um, just everybody. Everybody was helping me with this and continues to help me with this because ultimately they're the biggest group, um, in, in my opinion. We've got the pre-implementation pre survey, again, assisted by Health and Wellbeing Queensland, which we're just refining. Um, thanks, Sheridan, and uh, wherever you are. <laughs> and um, we're going to refine that uh, to meet the needs of um, our um, local environment, um, it's, it's quite a generic questionnaire at the moment, but that will enable us to know how people interact with the cafe, what's important to them, is healthy eating important to them, is their health important to them. From that we'll be developing some key messages, um, some bespoke uh, digital signage um, to go up to start promoting the change. Um, we've got some consumer promotional campaigns, again through Health and Wellbeing Queensland, uh, one of the first few sites to trial that, really excited to see how that works. And then, of course, a post-implementation survey. With the vendors, um, again, drawing on um, the data from the pre-implementation survey, that's important to them to know how their customers feel about what they want to eat um, and what they want available and what's important to them in terms of their health. 
Um, guided advice on suitable options. My God, that is such a small line, but it's such a big piece of work to actually look at every food in the cafe and that's available to them and work out where it is. Um, and, and thank you to the dietetics team for that. And data from other sites on profitability. Um, and I think just about everyone that presented this morning has, has shown that in some form or another. And then from that, some consumer promotional campaigns, which, which we mentioned earlier. And then closing the loop with some post-implementation survey data back to the vendors. So I don't know whether you noticed, but that ball just moved a tiny little bit up the hill there. <laughs> so what about the passives? Well, you know, I don't care. It's no big deal. I don't care what you do. How many of you have left a hotel or something and seen one of these questions? So how likely is it that you would recommend attending the ABC Expo to a friend or colleague? Of course, you're all likely to say 10, aren't you? But um, there is a score. Um, and these guys at the end here are promoters. Um, but passives, um, they sit here. So they're the ones that are ambivalent about... Um, the cafe, all the changes in the cafe, um, all the vending machines as we, we uh, move forward. And for me, that's about moving them to promoters. Because if Bob is asked about the cafe and says, meh, it's all right, and then Bob goes to the cafe and has something that's really good, the next time he's asked, he goes, actually, do you know what? It was a lot better than I thought it would be. And Bob has moved um, into a promoter and can start to bring some of those detractors in the orange into passives and so on. So that can help drive uptake and change um, and really, really crucially assist with sustainability. I think that ball moved again. There it goes. Look at that. So what have we done so far? Um, so uh, we've raised awareness with the executive and HHS committees. We've engaged with Health and Wellbeing Queensland and statewide food services. I like this term. We've socialised the program with cafe vendors. Um, and we've sourced an ABC compliant vending machine provider. We have at the end of... Are we still... Are we June yet? Is it still May? No, it's still May. All right. The end of this month... <laughs> get away with myself. At the end of this month, um, all our point of sales drinks cabinets will be compliant. So that's our first big, big win. Um, and we've formed a timeline for communication and change. Um, and I can't stress that enough in, in getting um, the comms team involved early so they understand uh, the program, what it's about, what the reach needs to be, and a rollout amongst all the other things that they have to deal with. What's left? Quite a bit. Um, hopefully in the next... A couple of weeks, we'll do the pre-intervention consumer survey. We will finalise the analysis of all the meals and we'll start our awareness campaign. We hope to replace all the vending machines with a new provider and, in fact, install a few more vending machines, um, implement the changes to the cafe, trial the consumer promotional campaign with Health and Wellbeing Queensland and evaluate how that works, um, run post-intervention consumer survey, and then build on a sustainability plan. Ultimately, um, the aim would be to have all of our vendors just sustaining this themselves with input from us if needed, as needed, rather than us constantly having to check on them. So what's our aim? As I said at the beginning, our aim is to move from here um, to here. Um, and... Um, should there be the opportunity, I'd love to come back and tell you how we did at some point in the future. Um, before I finish, I would just like to acknowledge the ABC family and with their names rather than the icons, um, Matt and Grace, um, uh, two directors of dietetics who've been um, awesome and I think are watching, so hi. Um, Kelly, um, who is a Royal Allied Health team lead, but also a dietitian. Um, Stan, our food service manager, and Jess from comms and marketing, who's been amazing. And then a shout out to the ABC team, particularly Sheridan, Alex, and Robin for your advocacy, your assistance with communication um, and knowledge, and of course, Denise and Brooke. Um, so thank you. Any questions, anybody for Paul? I do. <laughs> um, I really like that the theme really very much there is about bringing everyone on the ride, but what you did was consider 
who else you needed to bring, and that seemed to be a big part of the success of w what, you know how you've got about it. Yeah, like uh, you can't um, you can't do it all by yourself, um, and I think um, you know particularly um, my external family, as I call them, have just oodles of experience in doing this of why reinvent the wheel. But it's also great to to to, to partner with Health and Wellbeing Queensland to actually be at the forefront of some new novel ideas and and test those. Um, it it might not be known, but actually Wide Bay, I think, has the highest prevalence of obesity out of all the HHSs. Um, so um, we, this is something we really need to work on for our, our staff and for people visiting the facility as well. So it is asking for help and seeking out those resources, particularly when things aren't going well for you, rather than hiding from it. Absolutely. It's being accountable, but saying, we want to fix this. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't great, but now we know, let's do the best job that we can and involve as many people who can help us do that as possible. Yeah. Fantastic. Great presentation about how you changed um, the mindset, particularly of the executive. Um, but how did you manage the impost on your resourcing? Because I know that, you know, you're very light on up there in terms of staff. So how did you manage that resource? Um, so the additional resourcing was just some uh, unspent labour just to put the two directors of dietetics on just one day a week. So that was the only additional resourcing. This was just the, the, the project itself was something I had to just fit in with my other activities. <laughs> um, and that's just till the end of the financial year. So that does really drive the importance of the sustainability um, to this. But yes, it was it was... It was tough, and as uh, some of you might know, we did advertise for a project officer, but it's quite a quite a um, it's quite a skill set, um, and we didn't get anybody. So that's what we ended up doing in the end. Steffi Graf in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> that must be me, but it's really not me. If you saw me without my shoes running around the court a minute ago, uh, Paul, that was just excellent. Um, how can we get every single side across the state to be? Um, to be the same, um, to reach out. Do you think that they know? Do you think that they know that we are there as well or that Denise and the team are there? So what, what's the most important thing that we can do to support you, to support the teams and to, uh, and to um, uh, support the teams that are in the most remote parts of the state as well? I think it would be, uh, I would really like to see how this, is, how this goes. It's almost like an experiment, what we're, we're doing, bringing all of um, the externals in. So from, from my perspective, maybe it's evaluating how we did and then um, you know, uh, disseminating that a bit further. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't, um, different HHSs and different leadership take this in different ways. And you know, I, I don't have an answer about how you, how you address that. But in terms of those that do want to change, it's about saying, that's awesome that you want to change, but if we're going to do this in a way that's effective and sustainable, it's not just boof, fix it. Actually, there's a lot that needs to be, that needs to be done. Um, it's really about just slowing that process down and doing it as best as we can. I think it's sharing the story that you have told today, but to look at this um, again, as you said, in the next six to 12 months as well, and to really share, to really share the data so that we can show, because Queensland is different and different, different parts of the state need different things. So um, I think the more that we can do, do that, the more that we can share the data and the more that we can share this with the chief executives, the board chairs, um, anyone that will listen, then we, then we need to do that. But um, no, it was brilliant. Thank you, Thank you Paul.